uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and as you know, it looks nice outside here in Worcester. I have looking out my window, it's nice and sunny and it's not too early to think about some of the insect issues that we've seen last year and what maybe is in store for us uh, this coming year. And so this talk is gonna focus on corn insects um, and kind of give you an update of what's been happening um, in, the uh, in the past season. There we go. Um, so first we'll talk a little bit, some updates on um, some work that we've been doing at OSU, specifically uh, Kelly Tillman, our other field crop extension entomologist and her grad student and her team on Asiatic garden beetle. Uh, and then really focusing on some caterpillars in the ears. Uh, we've seen a lot more uh, evidence in, in pressure from caterpillars to lepidopterans in corn ears. So I think this is a good time to review some of that information. There's been some changes and updates, well not changes yet, but updates and proposed changes by EPA in terms of BT resistance and in terms of um, monitoring uh, for resistance and uh, uh, what types of BT traits might be, might be available or might not be available. Uh, we'll discuss those with uh, EPA, from EPA as well. Uh, first, an update on Asiatic garden beetle. This is an invasive white grub that was first found in New Jersey in one of uh, Kelly's, uh, Kelly Tillman's grad students, I think, uh, found this old article from a USDA building back in the 1920s, where they first reported Asiatic garden beetle invasive near, uh, in, in, on the shorelines of New Jersey. Now it's found in many parts of the United States. Um, and it's spread since then. So in about, you know, it's all about 90 years or so, no, actually 1921. So it's almost been hundred years. It's been around here. Uh, it's spread pretty, pretty rapidly. Now it's a pest in some areas and in other areas, it's not a pest, um, but um, it has kind of grown in its importance in certain areas. This species is different from other white grubs that might be in the soil, like chafers and Japanese beetles. Um, here's an example of um, two grubs side by side. This one, I believe, is a Japanese beetle grub. And this one here is an Asiatic garden beetle grub. They tend to be smaller. Uh, they tend to be more aggressive. Um, uh, and they're not, they're more kind of like a, a C-shaped rather than a semicolon shape. If you zoom in and you look closely, you can kind of see this white pocket here or white bubble. This is on its, um, uh, its teeth, maxillar palpus, and it's enlarged here on the Asiatic garden beetle. And so this would be a good way to identify the Asiatic garden beetle. Another good way to identify the Asiatic garden beetle, like I said, is they're aggressive and they will tend to bite. Uh, and they're really sensitive to light. So you hold them on your hand for a second or two, they're gonna wake up in five seconds and they're gonna try to move around and they're not afraid to bite. Um, and sometimes it can sting. So um, be careful when you're handling a Asiatic garden beetle. If you know it bites you, then you know it's an AGB. So, uh, between 2006 and 2012, and ever since then, it's become a regional but really serious corn pest, mainly in this sort of tri-state area, um, uh, northwest Ohio, northeast Indiana, and southern Michigan. Um, and we've seen reports mainly in corn, but in other crops as well, uh, alfalfa and even potatoes too. They can occasionally, occasionally feed on soybean, but it's not really a major pest. So we haven't seen any major damage yet uh, from soybean, certainly not in comparison to corn. These are pictures from uh, Northwest Ohio, uh, and you can see kind of the damage that, that we've seen. Uh, this area here looks pretty good, good stands. And then you have these pockets here that are really thin, and uh, a corn stand and, and almost you know missing plants too. And this is kind of typical uh, uh, damage that you'll see from EGB early in the season, you know, V3, V4 uh, stage corn, where it's really evident that the corn is not just, is not growing really, really well. Here's some other examples as well too. Now this is later in the season, the damage is still evident. And, and by now the damage is pretty much gone too. There's really not much to do, but you can see these pockets here all due to Asiatic garden beetle. And again, here really thinning of the stand. Um, what we have also seen is purpling of corn is somewhat uh, typical, not always, but it's somewhat typical of Asiatic garden beetle feeding. So here's an example of a, of a purple uh, corn stem here. And you even see in the midrib, it's getting a little purple. And of course, we pull it up here on the roots and you can see an Asiatic garden beetle here feeding on the roots. This is where they tend to feed. They tend to feed on um, 
brutes and the mesal caudal, um, and that really tends to, to thin out the plant. Um, now, if this works, this is a, so a scouting video. I'll turn off the sound. Um, and you can see here where we're just digging up a hand trowel, a simple hand trowel. Um, and there's one AGB right there. Um, and so there you can see that small corn plant, which kind of indicated there might have been some feeding going on there, a stunted plant, and digging around there. There's another one too. One thing you notice, and we'll talk about this in a bit, is that the soil here tends to be very sandy. This field was in Fulton County, Ohio, where we have sandier soil. I think that's the third one. Um, and it's a very loose soil. And we have, that's four, we have seen associations with this pest um, in sandier soils, that's five. Um, and that seems to be a really target. That's not to say that we cannot find them in other soils, but sandier soils are certainly, we believe, at more high risk from Asi Asiatic garden beetle. Um, and I think there is a sixth one that we'll find there eventually. Oh, there he is, number six. So just in that corn plant, we found six garden beetles. So this can be uh, an example of a really high pressure field that we sometimes see. This is the typical life cycle of the Asia, Asiatic garden beetle. It's um, one generation per year. And the real important time we think is April, May here. Um, so this is when they do a lot of the damage, especially to early planted and early and, and, and emerging corn. So if you plant um, the third or fourth week of April and the corn starts to grow and it's in that V2 stage, Right when these guys start to be active again is when they start the feeding. Um, so um, the life cycle is the adults tend to emerge in the summer, June and July. And you may have actually seen these. These are um, typically found near lights. Um, they can be pests as well, but it's kind of like a small brown cinnamon color. There's also the, the, the June bugs that are a little bit bigger, um, but these tend to be a little bit smaller and be more cinnamon color and, or auburn color. The eggs are laid in July or August. And then there's a couple of stages of growth here um, before they kind of overwinter as larvae. And, and right now they're overwintering. As soon as it starts to warm up though, they become a little bit more active um, in the second and third instar stage. And you can see the size here. And then that's when they start to do the damage on corn. There's a quick uh, pupation stage in May and June and then they come into adults. This is a key stage here too, because if you see damage in your field and you're digging, your, uh, and you're digging, you find um, late stage larvae or pupae, you know that most of the feeding is already done. Um, so if, there, if it's early enough, there might be some opportunities to replant. Other than that, any control at that point is gonna be probably uh, 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 not effective because in the pupal stage, there's just not much, the, the, the damage is done. There's not much more damage you can do to corn. So again, here's just an example of a picture where we see um, a soil map on this field. And here we have sandy loam and loamy sand. And you can see here, if we kind of do this overlay around these high areas of where we see AGB damage um, is present where we see a lot of sandy, uh, sandier fields. So the sandier fields we have, you are, um, the more likely you are to get AGB damage. What to look for. So again, look for the stunted plants, poor areas of growth, and that purpling corn, which is really good evidence of Asiatic garden feed, beetle feeding. We've seen plant stand um, even up to about 40%. Now, some of these areas you can do a replant, but in the replant time, you're looking at the first week of June or so. And so there's a yield loss associated with that uh, as well. Um, and especially be, just because it's gonna be a little bit later planted. And we also see indirect yield loss from late replant. So there's just costs associated with planting more seed. And yet there's the indirect yield loss of, again, being just late planted and, and typically what we see agronomically, um, poorer yields with later planted corn. So the good news is, is that um, Kelly's group is working hard to find newer tools and newer ways of managing Asiatic garden beetle. Um, we know, we have a good idea of what doesn't work, and that includes insecticidal seed treatments at any rate. Uh, we've done some trials of insecticidal seed treatments, and I think um, I, there was one field out of, you know, a couple that I got kind of a return of seed treatments, but it was really, really low pressure. Um, and I don't think it was uh, related to the AGBs. Um, and even the high rate, the 1250 rate of uh, seed treatments aren't gonna work for Asiatic garden beetle, especially, especially when you're in areas of high pressure. Um, 
if you're seeing six grubs on the video, like the video I showed, six grubs per corn plant, it's going to be very hard to find everything, anything seed treatment wise that's going to control six grubs. These guys are really active in the soil and they have a behavior that goes, that moves a lot too. So they can go into that zone, feed a little bit and then move out, feed a little bit and move out. And so they're not in that kind of protection zone uh, quite often. Um, so these seed, these seed treatments tend not to work, especially under high pressure. Most inferral products at the labeled rate sometimes could work, but it's not necessarily where we'd see really great control. Um, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. A lot of that could be related to the timing as well. If you're earlier, maybe you can get them if they're really young, but again, they move and so they're going to be really difficult to control that way. We haven't really seen a lot of success with tillage, maybe minor suppression. Um, and you might think because they overwinter as is, is grubs, um, that tillage might kind of disturb that soil enough to cause some mortality, but they're pretty deep down there. Um, and <clears throat> we only see minor suppression with tillage. We have heard of this, of this you know, trick of spraying soybean at R3. And so the idea is that when that um, soybean field is rotated to corn the following year, that's going to prevent damage because we see a lot of the adults in the soybean field. We're not sure if this exactly works all that well or not yet. Um, there's not really a good um, predictive ability of this. Yes, we see them in soybean, but just because you see Asiatic garden beetles in soybean doesn't mean that they're in there laying eggs and you're going to have a problem in that cornfield the following year. Um, it's just really unpredictable right now. We do see kind of an association with mare's tail where the adults like to hang out. And so we think there might be some um, uh, uh, association with the presence of mare's tail and then where the adults are gonna congregate. So one thing to think about is, is having good weed control late in the season. But spraying soybean at R3 for, for adults has brings up other issues associated with just soybean in that season. There's pollinator issues, there's higher risk of reinfestation of other pests. Um, and it just doesn't seem right now um, to make all that economic sense, although we're still working on research, getting more data on that. And again, the populations are just not that predictable um, whether or not you're gonna see it. So you could be just wasting a spray. Um, some things that do work is a chemical called chlorethifox. It's very effective based on some of the lab studies that uh, Kelly and her lab group have been doing. Um, one of the examples is index, with, which is a mix of chlorethoxphos and bifenthrin, and also smart choice. Now we've done some work on bifenthrin. Bifenthrin alone doesn't seem to be as effective as mixing it with chlorethoxphos, um, which tends to be, be a little bit more, um, uh, gives you a little bit more of that power uh, to, to kill the Asiatic garden beetles. And even at the lowest labeled rate, um, that this chemical works really, really well. Okay, so switching gears a little bit, we'll talk a little bit more about um, later season problems um, and more specifically, some of the caterpillars that we've been seeing in um, our corn ears in Ohio. You know, normally with a lot of BT and transgenic corn that's being planted in Ohio, we haven't seen a lot of uh, uh, caterpillars in ears because we pay that technology fee, we pay for that control and we should be, ex uh, be expecting control. But in the past five, 10 years or so, we have seen an increasing presence of these uh, caterpillars in ears. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a change that we're seeing in, in corn and something that we're gonna have to get used to. Uh, some of the reasons are because we're just seeing changes in the corn pest system. All the reasons are associated with the rise of BT resistance um, that we see, which is pretty worrisome. And, and now um, EPA is aware of it and, and is attempting to make changes on that. Um, but just uh, as, as a refresher, um, some of the pests that we see are Western bean cutworm, European corn borer, uh, and corn earworm. And these have been kind of the three main pests that we've seen increasing in, in incidence. Um, Western bean cutworm for a while there, I think in 2015 to about 2017 or 2018, we were seeing really high pressure on that, especially in the northern part of Ohio. European corn borer, I seem to get calls, three or four calls every year on European corn borer. Mainly this is in um, fields that do not have BT. Um, 
But um, you know, in the past, well, we haven't gotten any call any, any calls on European corn borer. But especially when you have no BT, we're seeing some incidents on that. And then corn earworm. There are a couple of years ago where we've seen really bad. Um, um, uh, damage from corn earworm. Typically, this is a sweet corn pest, but uh, I think it was in 2019 that there's a field near Worcester, Ohio, um, that had um, a really heavy damage of corn earworm. And again, these are not pests that we normally see, so it's a good time for a refresher. So for Western bean cutworm, it was first found in 2007 and became a really significant pest around 2013 and 2014. We saw really bad damage in uh, Northwest Ohio, again, Fulton County, Defiance County and that area. We saw some really significant feeding. It historically was a pest out in the Great Plains. And then in 2001, it started this expansion eastward and now it's found all the way on the East Coast and the Maritimes of, of Canada. Um, and we don't know why yet. Um, this is still an unexplained reason why we've seen this expansion east, and there have been a couple theories, but all that are just sort of unknown. Um, but the fact is that it's in Ohio, and it's been Ohio since 2006, and we've seen damage from about 2014. It has one generation per year, um, and the adults fly. They start their flight you know, mid, I'm thinking that between the second and the fourth week of June, this is normally weather dependent, but the peak flight is usually around mid-July, anywhere between the second and fourth week of July. That's when the adults are out, and that's when, if there is to be any kind of egg laying and overposition and larval um, development, it's going to be around that mid-July time. If you look for the adults, this is what the adults look like. Uh, they have a white stripe on the leading edge of the forewing, then they have this sort of dot here. And then they also have this sort of um, boomerang shape uh, towards the end. But, but the white stripe is a really good characteristic uh, identifier of the adults. And then the eggs, like I said, are laid from July until August. But the third, second to fourth week of July seems to be historically the most um, likely time in the, the, for the highest pressure of Western Maine cutworm. They're laid in clumps around 25 to 100, and they um, are in the egg stage from about five to seven days. And this is weather dependent as well. Warmer temperatures uh, tend to increase the development and increase the egg hatch. They start off as this, this kind of white color here, and then they turn a tan and pink. And then when they turn this purple color here, they usually hatch within 24 hours. And this is a key stage because if you're out scouting and you find um, a white egg mass, you know, knowing where that location is and coming back to that location to monitor for this change in color will help you target an insecticide application if it's necessary, because there's a very short window um, of a good efficacy. And if you hit it right, it's really effective. But if you miss the timing, it's going to be challenging to get good control. There's maybe a you know four, five, six day window where the larvae hatch out and they're um, susceptible to insecticides before they enter the ear. Once they enter the ear, it's going to be very difficult to control. They can enter through the tip, they can even chew through the sides, and enter through the side, and if they get in that husk, it's the insecticides are going to have very difficult time getting in there to control them. Um, one I good identification characteristic is these two black and brown broad stripes, white stripes right behind the head, and it's got an orange head capsule. They're usually not as colorful, um, kind of like a tan and, and brownish and maybe a little bit of striping. Again, they chew on the silk and enter or they enter through the sides. Most of the time, um, and it's, it's fairly common that you can see multiple larvae uh, per ear here doing a lot of damage on the, the kernels. So if you're out scouting, um, or at least trapping for the adults, um, when more than one adult uh, is caught per night in your traps, that's when it's, it's a good time to scout. If you're in the northern part of Ohio, you, the key times are going to be the second to the, to the fourth week of July to be in your fields and scouting for Western Bean Cutworm egg masses. Focus on pre-tassel corn, and this is the females prefer this because as um, the eggs hatch, what they're trying to do is time the egg hatch to when the tassels are out because the tassels are gonna shed pollen and the little larvae like to feed on that pollen before they enter, before they start feeding on the silks and entering the ear. So that's why the pre-tassel corn seems to be a really high risk. So if you're pre-tassel the second to fourth week of July, those are gonna be really high risk fields for Western bean cutworm infestation. The eggs are usually laid on the upper two most leaves. That's those tend to get the most pollen 
um, from the emerging tassel, and then it's really close to the to the emerging ear, the primary ear, where they can go then and start their feeding. Usually, these upper tumulus leaves are in the vertical position, um, right before tassel. So here's some threshold recommendations to inspect 10 plants at 10 locations um, and look across the rows too, not just down one row uh, and really target that pre-tassel corn and any replant or late planted areas that are not tasseled yet. Um, and our thresholds are based on egg masses and they're very low because the egg masses tend to have a high survival rate. And then once they survive, they can spread and move really rapidly and, and then take over the a field quite rapidly too. So if you have you know, 10 plants at 10 locations, so you're looking at hundred plants, if you have five of them that have an egg mass, treatment's probably gonna be necessary. And keep in mind that timing of treatment too. Spray after the egg hatch, but before the larvae enter that ear. So if you find eggs, it's a good idea to mark that plant somehow. Use GPS and your phone, tag it with Google Maps or whatever you need to do to go back there and watch for that development. If, they're the, if the eggs are white, it's going to be about maybe five days uh, weather dependent before that, the, those um, eggs start to hatch. And watch for that purple color. Um, you use products with good residuals because once they hatch, you know, if it's going to be on the corn plant and then that pollen, the small larvae are very, very tiny. They're very, very susceptible to a lot of uh, insecticides. Now you can use BT. There used to be two traits that were uh, offering control for Western bean cutworm, Cry1F and Viptera, the Vip3A. But we have seen that Cry1F does not work all that well anymore for uh, Western bean cutworm. And uh, we are only recommended VIP3A. There's resistance now to Cry1F. And while you may get some success, it's more than likely that you're not gonna get any success or less control. And then we're only, we could only recommend um, VIP3A. These are the results from 2021. And, and actually we've seen um, less pressure than in the past for Western bean cutworm. It seems like they, they sort of marched uh, eastward and then the pressure has been going down, but that's not to say that in some of our, especially Northern uh, counties here, Northern Ohio counties, we still see a fair number of adults and, and you know we're certainly not out of the window. There's always adults flying around and it's a good idea to get in your field and make sure that you're, um, and that you're seeing um, the control that you need to um, or that you're not missing out on infestations. Okay, a little bit on uh, corn earworm. Uh, these adults fly uh, July to more September. They're a little bit more later than Western bean cutworm in terms of the calendar of moths flying. Um, we have seen heavier populations in the last few years, um, especially in, in sweet corn. But again, we've seen uh, um, higher pressure even on field corn uh, with corn earworm. Um, and especially in a field corn. This is a pest that does not overwinter in Ohio. We've seen um, uh, more, well, it migrates from the Southern US and in the Southeast and the Southwest. Um, and just kind of anecdotally looking at some of the data in the past years here, and I don't have the data from, from the most recent years, but there were times where Ohio was getting a lot of remnants of hurricanes that were coming up from the South, whether that's the Southeast or whether that's through Texas and Louisiana. And down in the South, corn earworm is probably one of the biggest pests, it's certainly in cotton, but also in, because uh, it can feed it on cotton as well, but certainly in corn. Um, and once it gets in the atmosphere and those remnants of hurricanes, it can spread and, and deposit all these moths uh, in Ohio. So when we have a late flight, um, sometimes it can be related to a lot of the hurricane and the remnants that are coming up from Ohio. Corn earworms are very colorful and very different from uh, Western bean cutworm. They kind of have an orange head, but you can see here there's more stripy and they're more bright. They can be yellow. And some entomologists refer to them as nature skittles because they come in all colors of the rainbow, green, pink, black. Um, red. We've seen them all types of different colors. They tend to have these kind of um, really conspicuous holes, which are their spiracles, and then striping around the spiracles. Um, so in field corn, the uh, management can be uh, more difficult, um, but the silking is the most critical times. And these are very, very hard to scout for. So sweet, sweet corn growers usually just use the numbers from trapping, and they're usually more on calendar sprays because it's much more of a pest. These are the little eggs that are present on silks of corn, and they're very, very difficult to see. Um, so 
really the high, the best way to look at this is for trapping for moth activity. Um, one of the main benefits of BT was that it really worked well against corn earworm. And since because they're so hard to control for insecticide sprays and so hard to scout for, the BTs were really good at controlling corn earworm. But now we've seen resistance, to, especially to a certain trait, Cry1 uh, Cry A.105 and Cry2AB, that was a trait that worked really, really well. And they found resistance um, out east in Maryland on the eastern seaboard. And in a field that we found near Worcester in 2019, we had a lot of feeding on BT ears. And so we suspect that the, the, the localized outbreak we had was also BT resistant. And again, just like Western bean cutworm, the only trait that works for corn earworm is VIP3A and none of the other traits will work against corn earworm. The good thing, good thing, the thing is with corn earworm is that I would still count this as a rare occurrence in, in field corn, um, but there will be occasions where we tend to see uh, a lot more pressure especially in uh, future years of corn earworm on field corn. The other pest that we tend to have seen greater pressure for is European corn borer. Now this used to be the most important pest in corn in terms especially from an ear feeder, but we've hardly seen any damage from European corn borer. And this was mainly because of the BTs. The BTs were meant to target European corn borer, um, not necessarily for this other pest. So the BTs worked really well against the European corn borer. Um, and because they were high dose and there they were they multiple traits that were really effective. Um, this is can be, there's two generations a year for European corn borer. It's an early foliar feeder, um, and it's also an ear feeder later, later in the season. So um, it's even later than corn earworm. They tend to uh, feed a little bit on the kernels here, but they also like to burrow inside the corn and in the shanks as well. Uh, European corn borer is, is, can be identified by just being more kind of a drab coloring, less colorful, kind of just a gray um, and not really evident striping here. And their heads are a little bit more darker brown or black rather than kind of an orange head capsule um, uh, like a Western Maine cutworm carny or, and you notice here the absence of the two stripes behind uh, the head as well. Um, so if we think about the timing of these moths, uh, so this is the life cycle of European corn borer. They overwinter as larvae, either in the stalks that are on the field or even in the ground. Uh, uh, and then <clears throat> they pupate <clears throat> in May and June. In uh, late May, early June, they start to emerge as moths, lay eggs. Um, and then they can have uh, feeding. Sometimes you feed that shotgun shot hole feeding on corn plants that could be European corn borer. And then the larvae tend to burrow in the stalk here. Uh, and then they pupate in late July and then emerge and the moths emerge again in August, eggs and larvae. So this is the generation that tends to feed um, on, on the ears a little bit. And then they can get into the stalk and actually you can see the stalks bending a lot too. Um, Western bean cutworm is a little bit earlier. So they overwinters larvae in the soil. They have like this little earthen cocoon. They pupate in May. And then mid-June is usually the first time we see uh, a moth. But the, again, the peak flight is July where we see the eggs and then we see the larval presence here. Notice that if you spray for larvae in the last week of July, you're not likely gonna get any European corn borer. So you can't time a one spray that's gonna, you know, kill two birds with what to kill two, two worms with one stone, so to speak in here because of the difference in generation time here. And then Western Bean cutworm feed on the ears and then they drop into the soil and then uh, spend the winter as larvae. Corn earworm here in the, lar in, 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 the, uh, in the yellow, again, it's migratory. So we tend not to see them occur until about late July, early August. Um, they lay those eggs on the silk and then we have the larvae that feed on the ears. And then they, they, don't, they don't overwinter, so they die. And it's, it, they probably won't even make it back um, uh, in terms of the development, in terms of the adults. So they come up from the winds and they're here, they feed and then that's it, they're, they're, they're gone. Um, but that doesn't mean that they can do a lot of damage on here. So timing of these is, is very, very difficult. Um, there might be an occasion where European corn borer and corn earworm can be controlled at the same time for insecticides, but it's really rare to have them in the same field. Um, it's really rare to have them occur. So scouting is the key um, uh, tactic here to control, um, especially in, in, in the cases of BT resistance. How do you ID the eggs? Well, we talked about Western bean cutworms. Um, they're laid in clumps, white, uh, then they come a tan or pink and then a purple. Um, 
These are cornea remains. They're really going to be difficult to, to, to see in the silks, just singly on the silks here. Um, and then these are European corn borer. They're kind of like almost fish scales, very tiny as well. Here they are from the, t uh, the uh, in um, about the size of a, a tip of a pen here. Um, and when they're about to hatch, they turn to have these kind of dotted color here. These are the head capsules of the little larvae they're gonna uh, um, um, hatch out. They tend to be right here on the midrib as well here as on corn. So really hard to identify the eggs. Although if you see an egg mass, they're really different in terms of their shapes and sizes. ID for caterpillars, we talked about how corn are relatively colorful. Orange head capsule here. Here's Western bean cutworm, the two stripes behind the head. Normally you see that, but here's also um, a gradation of earlier and younger larvae. And sometimes it's not all that apparent, but again, you can see a orange head capsule and they're just not as stripy or not as colorful as the corn worms here. And of course, here's European corn borer, um, much less colorful, just kind of a gray and dull looking caterpillar. Uh, managing caterpillars, um, pheromone traps are gonna be the best way to look for the presence of these moths and to get an idea of whether or not they're gonna be in your field. Both are inexpensive and can really give you good information on when the moths are active. Um, so for Western bean cutworm, uh, we recommend these bucket traps. Um, uh, which the moths fly in here and they just get caught in these traps. Uh, Corneorum, usually these wing traps uh, work really well. These are two, two uh, pieces of paper, cardboard paper that have sticky glue on there. The moths fly in there and they get stuck and they get stuck into that glue. And then European corn borers, we recommend, these are called um, Helioethis traps or sometimes they're referred to as, as bell traps. Um, and the moths fly up here, and then they get trapped on here. Some of these are detachable, so you can just take them off and then put a new one on and then count the number of moths. These little rubber things are, are lures, and they give off a scent that attract the male moths. And so this is a good way to draw them in and one, to detect when the flight begins, and two, kind of detect how heavy the pressure is. None of our thresholds are based on the number of moths caught on these traps, but these traps will give you the information you need to know when peak flight is occurring to get in your fields in and then scout for the eggs and the larvae. Eggs are more important because of the short spray window, um, but if you have BT, you know, there still could be some issues in terms of control. There was a case of European corn borer resistance to Cry1F in Nova Scotia. Um, it may have spread to other parts of Canada. Uh, and the Viptera doesn't work against European corn borer. So only the other cry proteins will work. We have not seen evidence of Cry1F resistance in European corn borer. So as far as we know, um, all, most of the protein, all the proteins will work against European corn borer except Viptera. Uh, Viptera. Um, uh, that's not the case for, for the other Western bean cutworm and cornea worm, where only Viptera will work well. Because of this increasing resistance, there's going to be some potential changes in terms of insecticide resistant management. And EPA, if you haven't been keeping up to date with this, um, EPA is looking for comments on their proposal uh, to address resistance risks to Lepidopteran pest of corn. So they had a panel in 2008, a scientific advisory panel. They came out with recommendations in 2020. Those uh, recommendations were available for public comment and they just released this draft in November of last year on kind of their responses to these comments. Um, and here are some of the highlights. Um, they're redefining caterpillar resistance. Previously resistance needed um, collab confirmation, multiple generations and efficacy on that. And some of these pests, it's just not possible. So now they're looking for unexpected damage um, and it's referred to as sentinel resistance at the start. If you're in a field, that field is, is, is expressing BT traits and you have lepidopteran feeding, um, that now is termed sentinel resistance to that particular pest. All non-high dose pests. So we're talking everything except for European corn borer are at a heightened risk of resistance because these traits are not high dose against Western bean cutworm and cornea worm. Um, they also wanna think about phasing out some hybrids, especially those that are just having a single gene for um, above, ground, above ground control. Herculex only expresses cry1f, yield guard corn borer is only cry1a. Those single traits 
um, might not cut it in the future in terms of controlling lepidopteran. And so they want to really focus on pyramids, multiple traits, but functional pyramids. They want to uh, phase out non-functional pyramids. What this might mean is that there's going to be probably more VIP, VIP3A in the environment, because that's really the only thing that works against Western mean cutworm and corn earworm. They also want to increase the refuge seed blends from 5% to 10%. That includes areas in the north. That includes the main Corn Belt and Ohio. So we might see an increase of these seed blends. Right now, most of our lepidopteran traits are our refuge in a bag, which is 5%, but we might see an increase now to 10%. Um, we don't know if this is going to accelerate resistance to VIP or not because we see this kind of blending because of the pollination that occurs in corn. If you get refuge seed blending with the BT seed, sometimes you can see separation of the toxins in a corn ear um, and that could some can have BT, some cannot. So this is still an unanswered question on whether or not uh, what this is going to do to resistance management. We don't know what the final decision date uh, is yet of these recommendations to EPA, um, but they're going to be working with the companies and hopefully have something within the next year or two. How do we manage BT resistance in Ohio? Promote stewardship. Really think about whether or not you need the traits, okay? And rotate the traits as much as possible, especially before a phase out, if it occurs, happens. Always look at your BT trait table. This tells you what the trait name for the trait is and know what toxin it's producing because this will tell you whether or not you're going to have resistance or not. Um, entomologists, uh, especially Chris Defonzo at Michigan State and Pat Porter at Texas A&M have added this column here for resistance. And so these are the insects that have evidence of resistance in certain locations to these BT traits. So keep an eye out for that. And always look at corn performance trials and plant some non-BT as a learning process. You might not need it. You might be wasting that extra tech fee for the bag and you might not, none, but you might not need BT traits. So here's what EPA says, the next steps following publication, they're in the beginning negotiations with the industry about the conclusion. So there might be some changes uh, to IRM and BT, so stay tuned for that. Which BTs work for Ohio? Um, everything works well for room as we know, although that's not the case out west. European corn borer, everything works as far as we know. Corn earworm only VIP and western bean cutworm only VIP as well. Um, Always scout for unexpected damage. This is the new threshold for resistance. If you see any damage, contact your educator, contact uh, me or Kelly Tillman. We'll come out there, we'll take a look at that field and we'll try to run BT test strips to make sure that the corn's expressing BT and making sure that, you know, if it is resistance, we can document that for future. And with that, I will thank you. And if there's any questions and I have time, I'd be happy to answer a few questions. Thank you. Um, it says, interesting, the EPA and others can jump to resistance with pests that grow from cannibalism, timing of planting, et cetera. So, so I don't know if you have a comment on that. Yeah, let me see. I don't know if I can see the question or not. Maybe I can. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. Um, so, yeah, EPA, th that's a that's a proposal that they're changing the definition of resistance. And resistance is a key word because while we can, there, you know, it's hard to say that there's different levels of different definitions of resistance. Um, but determining something is if it's resistant has certain regulatory concerns. There's certain um, compliance concerns. There's certain mitigation and certain steps that legally the registrants, the companies have to take. So that's why there's some discussion on what actually is resistance or not. Um, in my opinion, I mean, if you plant BT and if you pay that extra tech fee and you feed and you see um, ear uh, worms feeding on that trait, that trait is not performing the way you want it to. That trait's not performing to what you paid for. And you can argue about the definition of resistance or not, but the bottom line is you've got damage when you weren't supposed to. Um, and so that's a concern. And that's what EPA is trying to kind of walk the fine line in terms of the regulatory definition. And also recognizing that there's a growing problem that we are seeing resistance to the BTs in some of these lepidopterans. And, and from a grower point of view, we just need to watch out for that. We need to know whether or not it's in Ohio and where in Ohio so that our growers can have better information on what traits are gonna work and what traits are not gonna work and what our, our expectations are.
the insects have to feed on the trait to die. So seeing feeding may not indicate resistance? Yes, that's a good question. And I will also add another observation is that if you have a cornfield out there that has damage, and if you see an ear that has feeding damage, because the refuge are in a blend, you know, that you may be just looking at a refuge ear by coincidence. And so if you see any damage in a BT field, it's important to do the BT test strips, whether that's through your educator, which we can supply those, these strips for a lot of the educators have been trained. I've been training them on how to do this. Um, you can do them yourselves or we can do it in our lab. Um, so that's another point too. So it's really important to look at the whole field, to look at a wide range of the field, collect as many ears as you can that are expressing damage. Now, you're right that the insects have to feed on the trait to die. Um, but a lot of the cases that we're seeing, the damage is way, is far more extensive than just a simple feeding and dying. Um, and we're seeing much more survival. In that field that was in Worcester that was corn earworm, we collected a lot of live, our live larvae that had done a lot of feeding and normally they should have died. And EPA, um, their definition of high dose is it should kill 99%, the, the, the level of toxin should kill 99% of the larvae, even at early stages. So if you see larvae surviving, that's probably, that's a really good indication that it's resistance and not just, you know, um, a larvae fed on it and now it's gonna die. Um, and we've actually seen, you know, uh, survival too. So um, that's a good point that just because you see feeding that doesn't necessarily need, mean resistance, um, but it could mean that there's a problem.